Good evening. Welcome to the William D. Harvey Theater. I'm Audrey Wolf, Director of Alumni Engagement here at Olympic College. This evening's presentation is the fourth event of the year in the ever, increasing popu ever increasingly popular alumni speaker series. The annual series strives to offer engaging and educational topics that are relevant in today's world. With a quick show of hands, how many Olympic College alumni do we have in the room tonight? Fantastic. So thank you so much for returning to Olympic College for this event. Um, and there are sign-in sheets being passed around. We'll start them over from this side. So please do go ahead and sign in. Um, and we can also add you to our e-news. So our, it's called The Lookout. And um, so you can hear about upcoming events. So next year, I'll give you a little teaser is we're going to ex expand the series. We're going to go from four in the series to six. So we'll be increasing what we're offering out to you. Um, this evening's presentation, Stronger in the Broken Places, is by Olympic College professor Dr. Philip Matthew. Dr. Matthew serves as a lead faculty for Olympic College Bachelor of Applied Science in the Organizational Leadership and Technical Management Program. He holds a PhD in Leadership Studies from Gonzaga University and is a licensed mental health and, uh, and chemical dependency counselor. He has served as a lecturer in psychology at Whitworth University and as a therapist in public and private agencies. His dissertation on resilience and leadership in the life of Viktor Frankl is in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Won't you join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew this evening? Thank you, Audrey. Well, good evening. So good to see all of you here tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight uh, for the OC Foundation's Alumni Speaker Series here at the beautiful Harvey Theater. I'm really honored by this invitation tonight, and I want to extend a special thanks to David Emmons, the director of the OC Foundation and his all-star team for all the support and the help. that they provide, uh, they provided for me and for all of us uh, here at the college. And it's great to see all of you here tonight as well. As I look out, I see uh, members of the Bremerton community, our campus community. Uh, so grateful that you're here. And especially, I want to extend a special welcome to our students, our current students, our alumni. Uh, welcome, welcome back. Uh, it's so good to see you here as well. So a student was asked, if it was your last day on earth, who would you like to spend it with? Well, this student said, I would spend my last day on earth with my professor. <laughs> and when I heard that, it, it really touched my heart. But, but then he continued. They asked him why, and he said, because he can make an hour feel like a lifetime. I'm hoping that's not the case tonight uh, as we explore this beautiful, this special topic of resilience. So I want to take you back to April 19th, 1995. Just after 9 a.m., a massive truck bomb exploded outside the Alfred P. Murrah building in downtown Oklahoma City. The blast collapsed the entire north face of the building, the nine-story north face of the building, instantly killing more than 100 people and trapping dozens more inside the rubble. The rescue effort took two weeks, and the final death toll was 168 people, including 19 children who were trapped, who died inside the building's daycare center. This is a picture of the survivor tree. This is an American elm that stood just yards away from the blast. It shouldn't have survived the massive truck bomb blast that day, 
because it was located right at Oklahoma City's ground zero. However, this amazing tree not only survived, but it thrived. And today it stands in Oklahoma City at the National Memorial. Now prior to the bombing, this tree stood in, in the parking lot outside the federal building. And it stood there for 90 years, blown and shaped by the Oklahoma winds. The tree provided shade for employees in the parking lot. In fact, many of them would get there early just to park under the shade of this tree. So some people loved this tree, others thought it was an eyesore. But either way, people didn't do a lot with this tree until it was the only thing that was remaining standing that day. And then after that, it was almost cut down to recover evidence that was embedded inside the trunk and in the limbs of this tree. But the Oklahoma City, com city community, the survivors, rescue workers, all came together and decided they wanted to save and protect this tree because it represents something that's very special, very beautiful, the very topic that we're going to talk about tonight, resilience. And so today, there's thousands of survivor trees growing in public and private places all over the United States because they took the cuttings of this survivor tree and they grew it in nurseries all over Oklahoma. And every year, seedlings from this tree are distributed across the United States. And from coast to coast, we have survivor trees that are growing. The inscription around this tree reads, the spirit of this city and this nation will not be defeated. Our deeply rooted faith sustains us. When I consider this tree, when I, when I think about this tree, I, I stand in awe because of what it represents and what, it's, what it testifies to. It, this tree stands as proof that even when everything seems lost in your life, even when we encounter days of tragedy and disaster and trauma and difficulty, that even in the midst of that, there can be hope and there can be rebirth and there can be resilience. In fact, the chairperson of the Oklahoma City National Memorial Museum, who lost her sister in the bombing, said this, it has become the most beloved tree in Oklahoma. The tree was literally burnt to a crisp in the bombing, yet it bloomed again. In his book, Farewell to Arms, Ernest Hemingway penned these famous words. The world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong in the broken places. The world breaks everyone. In other words, suffering, difficulty is all around us. Psychiatrist Scott Peck, one of my favorite authors, in his book, The Road Less Traveled, who, with this book has spent years on the New York Times bestselling list, bestseller list. He starts that book with three simple yet profound words. He starts that book with these words, life is difficult. Life is difficult. So suffering is all around us, difficulty is all around us, but at the same time, so is resilience. We see resilience in the environment around us, in biological systems. We see resilience in nature. We see resilience in people. People who've suffered experiences of war, political conflicts, disasters, people who've overcome the disadvantages of poverty and discrimination, refugees, even people who seem somehow to get off track in their life at some point, but somehow they manage to right themselves and get back on the right path. I'm honored to teach leadership, organizational leadership at, at this college and, 
and work with some of the best students I've ever worked with. And one of the premier leadership scholars, James McGregor Burns, he once wrote these famous, famous words that, that leadership is the most observed and yet least understood phenomena on earth. I think those same words can be said of resilience as well. As people, we've always had a fascination with resilience. We're about four waves into the study of resilience as a science at this point. But even before then, before it became an academic subject, as people, we've been fascinated with resilience. It's in our myths. It's in our legends. It's in our stories. We love to hear stories about people who overcame difficult odds, who, who, who overcame obstacles and challenges. And it's on, it's on our poetry, it's in our music, it's in our songs. When we hear the words to I will survive or uh, the, the, the theme to Rocky, or our spirit gets energized as we hear about resilience. My goal tonight is very simple. It's to help us better understand one of the most fascinating human phenomena that there is, which is resilience. What is resilience? Where, where does it come from? Why are some people more resilient than others? And can we cultivate resilience? I believe we can, otherwise I wouldn't be standing before you tonight. So let, let's start with the definition of resilience. This definition comes from Dr. Ann Maston, one of the foremost resilience researchers in the world today. She works out of the University of Minnesota and has done some incredible work, especially with children who survived traumatic experiences all over the world. And she defines resilience as the capacity of a system to withstand or to recover from disturbances that significantly threaten its adaptive functioning, its viability, or its development. There's a lot in that definition, and we're going to unpack some of that tonight. Essentially, resilience is about positive adaptation in the face of risk. We, we get the word resilience from the Latin resilere, which literally means to bounce back. I want to ask you a question this evening. Think about that for a moment, and then I'm going to ask you to turn to a person next to you and answer this question, just a one-question conversation. I'd like you to think back to a time when you went through a very difficult experience in your life. And my question to you is this, what got you through? What got you through? Think about that for a moment. Turn to someone next to you and just in one word, tell them what it is that got you through, please. So, so if you don't mind sharing, just, just in one word, what got you through? Let's hear from those, those of us that are here tonight, just in one word, what, what's one thing that got you through? What's that? Determination. Determination. Stubbornness. Stubbornness. Good word. Love. 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 Beautiful. Faith. 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 nature. All right. So we could go throughout the audience tonight and each of us would probably have an answer to that question. And I ask you that question because this was the question that was posed to me by my resilience mentor, Dr. Jerry Shepard from Gonzaga University. I was in the last year of my doctoral program 
And I decided to take this class, very simply entitled Leadership and Resilience. And at that time, I'd gone you know, through my doctoral studies, and it was time to find my dissertation topic. And I still had no idea what I was going to write about. But something led me to this class. And I sat down in Dr. Shepard's class, and she introduced me to this phenomena of resilience. And this was very interesting to me, because at the time, I was working as a mental health counselor. So in, in my work, I, I worked with people who were going through some very, very difficult times, and uh, who were justice involved, who were involved with substance abuse, so many different problems in their life. And even though I had been working for years with, with with, the, with, this, with this population, with, with these clients, I was missing something. And what Dr. Shepard showed me was that I was missing, the piece that I was missing was the resilience that was all around me. I was all around it, but I didn't realize it. Because so much of mental health, the medical field is focused on pathology. We always are trying to fix what's wrong. And don't get me wrong, there's a place for that. We should do that. But it can't be the only focus of our lives, of our work. So the fields of psychology and mental health historically have focused on pathology. And we view the nature of a person from a deficit model, from a damage model. Some people call it the medical model. Buckingham and Clifton, who write a lot um, around the work of strengths, say something very interesting. Uh, Guided by the belief that good is the opposite of bad, we've spent centuries pursuing our fixation with fault and failing. Doctors study disease in order to learn about health. Psychologists investigate sadness in order to learn about joy. Therapists study divorce to find out what makes for a happy marriage. And, and, and they say that in schools and in workplaces around the world, each one of us, we've been trained, we've been encouraged to identify and analyze and correct what's wrong with us. And that, that's good, that's well-intentioned advice, but it's misguided. Because what they say is that they, that reveals very little about strengths. That strengths, that resilience has its own pattern. But as, as someone said, we, especially in the field of psychology, we spend most, most of our time studying the dire, the deadly, and the derailing. Now, this, the scientific study of resilience uh, happened, began about a half a century ago. And it was almost by accident. You're looking at on the screen, this is what I call the pioneers and the trailblazers of resilient science. Now, most of the early research on resilience started by studying risk and adversity. They were trying to understand the origins of mental illness and behavioral problems. And many of these early researchers were studying high-risk children, children in, in high-risk groups, people, children who were growing up in dangerous neighborhoods, uh, difficult family situations, war zones, uh, children who are experiencing uh, parental conflict or uh, substance abuse of, with, w by the parents. And what they saw was that even though they were in this high-risk group, many of them were doing surprisingly well. And so they, there began a series of really landmark studies. Uh, we have Norman Garmezzi uh, from the University of Minnesota. And he is a, was a lead researcher for Project Competence. And Ann Maston worked closely with him, and he studied parents of children with schizophrenia. We have Michael Rudder from Great Britain. He's one of the world's leading child psychiatrists. And he did many of his most memorable studies on children who were the orphanages of Romania. Michael Unger from Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, he leads the International Resilience Research Center in Canada. And they research resilience in over 14 countries. Dr. George Bonanno from uh, the Columbia, Te uh, Columbia University's Teachers College. He's done a lot of very fascinating work among the survivors of the post-9-11 attacks. 
But perhaps the most well-known study of resilience to this date uh, is the Kauai study by Emmy Werner and Ruth Smith. Emmy Werner was a professor at UC Davis, and Ruth Smith was a psychologist on the island of Kauai. Now, this is a really interesting study because what, what they did was they studied a birth cohort. They studied a group of children that were born in 1955 on Kauai, and they followed these children over time. Now, this is a fascinating study for many reasons, but one, one reason is because there were relatively few longitudinal studies that were happening at the time. In the 1940s and the 1950s, most of the studies were retrospective. They looked back at, at a person's life. So they, they studied these participants who were in jail or having some type of difficulty in their life. They looked back and tried to figure out what was going on uh, with them, what, what went wrong somewhere along the way. And initially, the Kauai study started as a study of risk. And they were very interested in collecting data on the kind of risk factors that, that might affect uh, children's health and development. And so you had a variety of risk factors uh, from poverty, congenital handicaps, alcoholism, violence. And you can see those there, a, a variety of risk factors. And in this study, in this longitudinal study, what they found was that many of the children in, in the Kauai study, they developed really serious problems by the age of 10. But what turned this into a study of resilience was a, was a great surprise, something that they weren't expecting. It turned out that about one-third of the children who were in these high-risk situations, they ended up doing very well in their life. And then within that one-third, you had another that other group who was classified as high-risk. And even with them, even those in the high-risk group, they began to do better as they got older. And Werner and Smith, what they found was that even though many of these children, even in, in, during the teenage years, the difficult teenage years, they were experiencing delinquency, mental health problems, teenage pregnancy, but that by the time they got to their thir 30s and 40s, because they checked in with them up until about age 40, that many of these students, these, 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 these children who were now adults, they had become successful functioning adults. And this was a great surprise. They weren't expecting this. Even they, they had what they called late bloomers. And so this study and the studies that followed, even contemporary studies, we came to the understanding that all along we've been asking this half-baked question. Instead of asking what has gone wrong, Perhaps the better question is, what's gone right? What's gone right? And so these early studies and even the more contemporary studies gave us some insights. I'll share those briefly with you. The first insight is that we were not spending enough time studying resilience. We were, we were spending a lot of effort studying risk, but not enough time studying resilience, risk, risk factors, but we were neglecting the study of people who were doing well and recovering well. So let me ask you this question. Raise your hand if you've heard of PTSD. Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of PTG. Okay, I see a couple of hands. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTG, is post-traumatic growth. It's just as valid as PTSD but we don't seem to hear much about it. So the first insight was this risk versus resilience, this imbalance, we need to widen the lens. The second insight was what, what they call this range of reactivity, that there's great variation in outcomes. Even among the children who were classified as high risk, less than one in three failed to attain a productive childhood. You can read this, there's many books that have been written about the Kauai study. So the insight that they gained was problems don't always predict how a person is going to do. Something else does. That risk doesn't automatically equal outcome. And that a, your behavior at a certain point of your life does not equate to your potential and to your capacity.
The third insight that came that we're realizing out of these many resilience studies is that there's many pathways to resilience. Just like when you and I suffer, we all don't suffer in the same way. The science is telling us that we aren't all resilient in the same way either. Resilience can look different for, for each of us. We can be resilient in different ways, in different times, in different situations. In one situation, you might be really resilient, but in another situation, not so much. So Ann Maston developed this pathways model, which, which I really like. And the dashed lines in this model represent uh, resilience pathways, various forms in which we adapt. So if, if you look at this in these different pathways from a stress-resistant pathway, pathway E, uh, or pathway A, I mean, even though they experience acute stressors, uh, they continue to function well, pathway B, C, and D. You can see that, that sometimes resilience means bouncing back from adverse events, but in other cases, resilience means bouncing forward. It's what we call post-traumatic growth. Whereas other people, they may go through a very difficult uh, experience and, and their functioning drops, but then either spontaneously or through some intervention, they return to baseline functioning. So there's different pathways to resilience. So what, what we're learning, th these insights about risk and resilience and about widening the lens and this range of reactivity, we're learning many things about resilience. We're also learning many things about what it's not. Resilience doesn't mean that you're superhuman. It, it doesn't mean that you're invincible. They used to talk in terms of the in, invulnerable child. It doesn't mean that you're this person who pulled themselves up by the boot, bootstraps that, that we so much like, like to talk about or that you're this tough and rugged individual. Nor is resilience, and this is really important, resilience is not a personality trait. It's not something that you have or don't have by some genetic gift. Are there genetic factors? Absolutely. But the, the genetics doesn't determine your outcome. It can influence it. But there are a lot of resilience is left up to our individual motivation and to the environment in which in, in, that we're surrounded by. So how, did, how do people positively adapt? Even though they're encountering risk, that question that Jerry Shepard asked me back in my class, what got them through? I want to share with you the, the process of resilience. Now, this is a process that builds over time. Uh, and so we, we can say that resilience uh, expresses itself in, in, in this manner. The, it, it's a process of exposure to challenge and adversity plus protective factors and finally adaptive systems. So I'm going to talk about those briefly now. Uh, the first component to uh, resilience is exposure to significant challenge or adversity. So Michael Rudder, the child psychiatrist I told you about, he said that resilience is not just doing wonderfully, that's called competence. Okay, resilience is when you're doing better in relation to bad experiences than other people with similar bad experiences. So the essence of resilience is that you, in events that challenge you to face new stressors and then to grow. So resilience just doesn't occur, post-traumatic growth doesn't occur just because you face a stressor, but what they're saying is the stressor, the difficulty, somehow is essential in this process. One re uh, researcher put it this way, while it's not the trauma itself that's responsible for the growth, as much as what happens in the aftermath of the trauma, it is important that events are challenging enough to your assumptive world to set in motion the cognitive processing necessary for growth. And that often comes through major life events, challenges, something that shatters what psychologists call our assumptive world, our fundamental beliefs, our goals, our views, our, our paradigm. It, it shatters that, th this life stressor, this difficulty. And 
We're not saying that you should go out and be a masochist and try to find suffering in your life so that you can be more resilient. But what they're talking about is legitimate suffering, unavoidable suffering. One of my greatest inspirations for resilience and, and this whole idea of encountering adversity and difficulty as the first ingredient of resilience is Johnny Erickson Tata. You may have heard about her. She uh, grew up in California and at 17, very active. She was, uh, loved to go hiking, very active teenager, horseback riding. She was the captain of her high school, high school lacrosse team. Uh, but at age 17 years old, uh, she went swimming. And during the swim, she dove into the water and she broke her neck. And I'm going to show you a little clip from, uh, from uh, her movie. It was like any other day. Um, my sister Kathy and I thought that we would spend some sister time together before I headed off to college. So she invited me to go to the beach with her boyfriend. And um, I was supposed to have had a tennis date that afternoon, but he canceled out on me. So I had an afternoon free, and I jumped into my sister's Volkswagen and headed down to the beach and left my towel up on the sand. And, waded out into this water and saw some children jumping off of a raft. An athlete that I was, I just swam right out to it without touching bottom. So I didn't have a clear idea of how deep the water really was or how shallow. All I saw were children jumping off, diving off. And of course, I'm a tall 17-year-old. And I did a pike dive off of this raft and did not pull out of it in time. It was a really stupid thing to do. And immediately my head hit the sand, snapping my neck back, crunching my fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae, uh, severing my spinal cord. And I'm just floating face down. Johnny? That's a little bit of Johnny's story. And today, she's an advocate for, dis for people with disabilities around the world. Her, her wheelchair has become a pulpit for her, and she delivers a ra daily radio program around the world, Johnny and Friends, and she speaks to tens of thousands of people around the world. So she experienced what Professor Warren Bennis called the crucible of suffering. A crucible back in medieval times were vessels that alchemists used where they tried to turn these base metals into gold. And so each of us have crucible experiences in our life, that experiences that shape and transform us. So the first component of resilience is this exposure to adversity or suffering. Now the second, uh, this is a great quote from Viktor Frankl as well, what is to give light must endure burning. Um, a second ingredient, if you want to call it that, to resilience. It's what's known as protective factors. Now across the literature, we see this over and over again. And what a protective factor, sometimes they're called moderators, what they do, they moderate the relationship between the adversity, the, the risk factor, and the impact of the outcome that you experience. So this is one definition. Uh, so they, they serve as buffering agents. And we see that what makes a difference in people who we say the, the see are, that, that we see are resilient is that they have these protective factors in their life. So this is a model by Richardson, and he kind of diagrammed how, how this works. We, we start off in a state of homeostasis, our present condition, uh, our comfort zone, you might want to call it. And we're bombarded every day by stressors and life events and difficult circumstances. And how well we deal with those depends on the protective factors that we have uh, surrounding us. Now, disruption happens when the stressors are greater than the protective factors. And so we have this disruption, and this process of disruption happens, and we begin to ask ourselves, okay, now this is happening to me, what am I going to do? 
And we began this process of reintegration. And this process can take days, it can take months, it can take years. And eventually we move toward reintegration. And there's different ways, different pathways that we can reintegrate too. At the top is what we would call post-traumatic growth, where we gain some insight and grow from that. There's returning to homeostasis, not just bouncing forward. Some people say, I don't, you know, I don't want to do better. I just want to get back to where I was before this happened to me, and that's fine too. But there's also different other ways where you might reintegrate with loss or disappointment, where you lose some motivation or give up some goals, and then at the, at the other end there is dysfunctional reintegration, where a person uh, reintegrates in, in a destructive way, sometimes through substance abuse um, or, or other um, deleterious ways. So th this is a model of resilience, and the key thing there is to notice the protective factors. Anne Mastin developed what she called the short list. And this is what she has found over and over and over again in the literature, the short list of protective factors. And so there's many kinds of protective factors out there. And what you'll notice, really important to notice is, these aren't all just individual factors, are they? Okay, they're also linked outside the individual. So you have people who are resilient, they have internal protective factors, but they also have external protective factors. They have internal strengths, but they have external lifelines. Someone said, nobody is resilient alone. And so that's why it's really important to have these protective factors, not only just within ourselves, but in the environment and the systems that are around us. So there's this internal toolbox and these external lifelines. And this is what's called an ecological understanding of resilience. Now, I want to highlight really quickly just three of these protective factors. Now, this, the three that I'm highlighting comes from an article by Diane Couteau, a great article uh, found in the Harvard Business Review, and she, entitled, How Resilience Works. And um, these are the three that I want to highlight briefly for you tonight. People who are resilient, and we see these again over and over again in the literature, is first of all, they have a staunch acceptance of reality. Secondly, they're able to make, make, make meaning of their experiences. And third, they're really good problem solvers. So let's talk about that first one. The people who, are, who experience resilient outcomes, they have this staunch acceptance of reality. That's what she calls it. And there's this common belief that people who are resilient, uh, they're optimists. And Couteau says optimism is good in as long as you're not wearing rose-colored glasses. Because... Rose-colored glasses in adverse situations can actually be very dangerous. Viktor Frankl uh, is best known for his book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's listed as one of the 10 most influential books in the United States. It sold millions of copies worldwide. And in that book, it describes his experiences as a Jewish prisoner of Hitler's death camps during World War II. Now, Frankl was a neurologist and a psychiatrist by training. And his signature contribution to the field was logotherapy. He was a contemporary of Freud and Adler. And logotherapy means essentially meaning therapy. He helps people overcome depression and adapt well in life by finding their unique meaning in life. So he was the chief of neurology at a Vienna hospital. And there he would make false diagnoses of mentally ill patients so they wouldn't be euthanized by the Nazis. And Frankl spent a total of three years in four concentration camps, including Auschwitz. He lost his father, his mother, his uh, wife died in Bergen-Belsen, his, his brother died in one of the branches of Auschwitz, and only his sister survived. She was able to emigrate to Australia. So in the concentration camps, he said he was number 119-104. He was just seen as just a number, he said. And he said that life in the death camps meant being threatened by death continuously, daily and hourly. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Frankel in, in a moment, but he said it was just an unrelenting struggle for daily bread and for life itself. Frankel was liberated near the end of the war, and he ended up spending most of his remaining years lecturing around the world about his experiences and his philosophy. 
Uh, another person who we can say had a staunch acceptance of reality is Malala Yousafzai, an amazing young woman. She's from the Swat Valley of Pakistan. And her father was a teacher who ran his own school. He was an educator who provided education to his community. But while she was a teenager, the, the Taliban began to take over in the Swat Valley and eventually began to uh, bring in all these prohibitions, including the prohibition that girls could not go to school, a ban on girl uh, education of, of women. And so she and her father actively spoke out against this. They even defied the ban, and she was threatened with death many times. And what happened was at age 15, there was an assassination attempt on her life. She, was going, she just had finished her exams, and she was heading home, and she was on the bus with her friends, and the bus stopped suddenly, and two men, two Taliban, got on the bus, and they asked one question, who is Malala? And they shot her in the head. And finally tonight, our Person of the Week. There was another name on the shortlist for the Nobel Peace Prize today. Malala, 16 years old, the youngest nominee. She was shot because she spoke up for the 31 million girls around the world who cannot get an education. Her new book is I Am Malala. And tonight, the miracles, the reason she survived that bullet from the Taliban. Two men approach a Pakistani school bus like this one, men with beards and a gun, a Colt 45. One of them climbs on the bus and asks a question. Who is Malala? She doesn't remember what happened next, but her friend described the moment. He fired three, three bullets, and one hit you on the left side of, uh, of, of my head. I would have been doing like this, so I hide my face because there was gunpowder on my fingers. She is bleeding in grave condition, but two hours pass before a helicopter can deliver her from the local hospital to a military surgeon. He spends five hours trying to relieve the swelling on her brain and remove tiny clots. By a strange coincidence, there is someone in Pakistan for the first time. A top specialist in pediatric trauma from England. Dr. Fiona Reynolds, with her colleague, Dr. Javid Kayani. They've been sitting in long governmental meetings on medical programs when suddenly Dr. Reynolds is told to race out and try to save the life of a famous and dying child. The tubes have given Malala an infection. The machines are improperly set. Her blood isn't clotting. Her lungs and kidneys are beginning to fail. She had become septic. It was obvious that she had a very serious life-threatening infection. Dr. Reynolds makes a risky recommendation to take the gravely ill girl on an eight-hour trip to a high-tech hospital in England. From another Muslim country comes a life-giving offer. The Emir of the United Arab Emirates sends one of his royal planes outfitted as a hospital, a state-of-the-art intensive care unit. And for the entire eight-hour flight to England, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Kayani keep Malala alive, breath by breath, organ by organ. And they also have noticed something else that defies possibility. The bullet took a path that simply cannot be believed. The chances of being shot at point-blank range in the head and that happening, I don't know. But it is amazing, truly amazing. I, I don't know why she survived. Maybe his hand was shaky. He hit her there. So it goes under the skin, near the skull. A bullet traveling 1,000 feet per second slips under Malala's skin. But as it heads toward her brain, that bone turns out to be so strong and curved, it forces the bullet to ricochet away and instead smashes her eardrum, severs the nerve in her face, and hits her shoulder. The fact that she didn't die on the spot or very soon afterwards, and to my mind, is nothing short of miraculous. Miracle? If you believe in miracles, yes, absolutely. Maybe it's the backbone and here's the brain, and God saved me. But still, doctors have no idea if she'll ever walk or see or be able to speak again. They are amazed when moments after her eyes open, she uses a letterboard to spell out in English the words country and then father. 
ahead of her, three months of punishing therapy and more surgery to reconnect the nerve in her face. Through it all, Dr. Reynolds notes of her young patient. I have never seen Malala cry, never. She's incredibly stoical. She had to have some sutures uh, in her uh, wound in her scalp, and she also had to have a needle to drain some um, infected fluid from her neck. And on both occasions, she didn't wince, she didn't cry, she didn't even squeeze my hand when they were sticking needles into her. I didn't cry because now I totally changed after that incident. But I don't know how did I change. I don't know what happened to me. But I have to say, who, who can do this? Her. We all cry. I was feeling that this is a new life. Malala says she thinks death just wasn't ready for her. I think death didn't want to kill me. And God was with me. And the people prayed for me. And so we choose Malala Yousafzai. Amazing story of of Malala, and you want to talk about staunch acceptance of reality. She embodies that so well. The, the second protective factor is this idea of meaning making, and this is really, we see this again in literature over and over again. People who are resilient have this ability to make meaning of terrible times, and out of that search for meaning comes growth, and this was really the true essence of Viktor Frankl's life, life's work. Uh, he came to this realization when one day he was in the concentration camps and he was worrying whether he should trade his last cigarette for a bowl of soup. And he suddenly he said he realized that he, was how, that he was actually disgusted by how trivial and how meaningless his life had become and that he had to find a purpose if he was going to survive. And so he pictured himself standing on a platform of a well-lit lecture room and giving a lecture to an audience on the psychology of, con of the concentration camp. And he said, all that oppressed me at the moment became objective, seen and described from the remote viewpoint of science. And he realized that his meaning was to help others understand what he had been through. And he said the difference between those who survived the camps and those who didn't, sometimes there was no medical or physical difference, was whether they had a purpose and a meaning for their life. And he said there's three ways that we can find meaning in life. We, we can find it by doing a deed, experiencing something or someone, or through suffering, encountering suffering. And he said this powerful statement, he said survival cannot be the supreme value. Unless life points to something beyond itself, survival is pointless and meaningless. It's not even possible. And so he says we need something that will enlarge our vision, something that's greater than ourselves, uh, bigger than we are. And he said that means you know, taking responsibility for finding that meaning in our life. And Frankel often did that in many ways. One of the ways that he did that was he became a servant leader in the camps. So many of us, when we face suffering and adversity, our instinct is to turn inward. But, but Frankel decided he was going to serve, and he became uh, uh, served the people who, who had uh, typhus. He ran uh, efforts for suicide prevention in the camps. And what he said was, the more that you forget yourself by giving yourself to a cause or to serve or love another person, the more human you become. I want to show you this brief clip from Dr. Frankel. Certainly nobody of us is spared suffering at one time or another. In his darkest hour began a new start. But everybody in the midst of suffering has given me, ch has, has given me chance to bear testimony of the human potential at its best, which is to turn a personal tragedy into a human triumph. From his suffering in the Nazi concentration camps, Viktor Frankl salvaged a universal message on the meaning of life. Believe me, the one great lesson to learn from both types of camps and imprisonment was that under equal circumstances, those prisoners have the highest chance of survival, who were oriented toward the future. Victor Frankl. Perhaps some among you might have read 
or come across the book Man's Search for Meaning. Based on his widely acclaimed book, Man's Search for Meaning, Lifespan... So you can see there a little bit about Dr. Frankel and um, his, his search for meaning. And we see this, again, in the literature, is this, is this pull towards meaning, having a larger purpose. And it becomes a, a very significant protective factor. Malala, Johnny, we see that over and over again. Now, the third protective factor is creativity. We see that many people who are resilient, they have this ability to problem solve, to be inventive. And for, for Frankel, sometimes it meant something like using a string or a wire to, to fix a pair of shoes in the concentration camps, otherwise his feet would freeze to death. It's what Couture calls this kind of inventiveness, an ability to improvise solutions out of thin air without any tools or materials, is creative survival. Um, in, in one instance, uh, Dr. Frankel, uh, when he was at Auschwitz, uh, he encountered Dr. Uh, uh, Joseph Mengele, the angel of death, and Mengele was putting people in two lines. The left line was the line that was headed toward the gas chambers. The right line was headed toward the work camps. And Frankel was put in the left line. And he saw his friend standing over there in the right line. And when Mengele had turned his back, he ran over and stood in the right line. And he said, I don't know where I got the courage to do that, but he did that. So different ways that people uh, experience and express their creativity. For Malala, she would hide books under her shawl when the Taliban banned education. For Johnny, she's able to draw amazing pictures using her mouth, putting a pencil in her mouth. So resilient people have this amazing capacity to, to solve problems in very creative ways. And then the fourth and final component of resilience is a supportive social context. And by the way, that's me with Johnny. Um, I had a chance to meet her uh, several years ago and just a wonderful uh, human being. The, the, the final component of resilience that I want to touch on is the support of social context. This is what are called lifelines for resilience. Like I said, no one is resilient alone. We have this image of the rugged individual, but people who are resilient, they have this ability to recruit others into their life for help. And we see this over and over again, whether it's in the 9-11 attacks, uh, in uh, depression, PTSD, the Kauai study. We see this in, in many situations. For Malala, it was her dad. And if you read her book, amazing book, uh, Malala was, her father was her dream keeper. Her father used to say, I will protect your freedom, Malala. Carry on with your dreams. Are you scared now, I asked my father. He said, at night our fear is strong, but in the morning, in the light, we find courage. And so these are the components, the process of resilience, this exposure to risk and adversity, followed by protective factors. And the more that we have within ourselves and in the environment around us, it has that buffering uh, uh, element. And then these lifelines of resilience, the support of social context. So in, in closing, let's go back to Mastin shortlist. And I'll just wrap up with this. If you look at this list, uh, what, what you see are, are the basic ingredients of resilience. And what Mastin says is something that's really interesting. She said what she noticed about this was this list isn't very surprising, is it? And maybe you find that as well. What she calls resilience, and I love this word, ordinary magic. Ordinary magic. It's ordinary because all these things are, are basic adaptive systems. Resilience doesn't require anything special or anything unusual. It's a very ordinary thing. But what it does require is the operation of these basic systems in our life personal development, as well as these engines of resilience, which are these external lifelines, the supports, the institutions around us. And to build resilience in our lives, it, 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 it develop, it's this combination of what Katie Butler calls a uh, combination of inner strengths and outer health. You need both. So resilience is within you. 
It's also all around you. It doesn't require anything rare or extraordinary. It comes through very, some very fundamental processes. You can also help others be resilient as well. You don't have to leave here in this room and go get a PhD to help someone uh, develop resilience in their life. My, one of my mentors, Dr. Shan Furch at Gonzaga, he always would quote, tell us the quote from Van Gogh, who said, the greatest work of art is to love someone. The greatest work of art is to love someone. And so what Mastin says, Ann Mastin says, is the greatest danger when it comes to resilience is not the adversity itself, it's what happens to these adaptive systems, our institutions, to society, to our community colleges, all, all these systems that are part of our life, social service agencies, when our, our, our family life at home, the, the quality of our parenting, when those systems become unavailable or greatly diminished, it affects our capacity for resilience. We started tonight by talking about the survivor tree. And that's how I want to finish tonight, is as I look at this audience, what I see tonight are many, many survivor trees. And so if I were to ask you tomorrow, I gave you a test on what you learned tonight. You know, I like to give tests. Uh, what, what would you, you know, what would you say? You might say, well, I, well, I learned about what resilience is, and I, I learned about how the process of resilience, and I looked at some about protective factors and, these, and the importance of a supportive social context. But you know, I think the real test is when we leave here tonight and go into our world tomorrow, is to become and live out the idea, the idea of being survivor trees, both for ourselves and for others. I'll finish with this quote from Viktor Frankl uh, that he writes in his book that speaks to the defiant power of the human spirit. Our generation is realistic, for we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Yisrael on his lips. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for your attention.